have been your family so good to be together in scripture it says declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples for great is the lord and great to be praised so i don't know about you guys but for me god brought me from very deep down and he gave me a new life and that is so 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 good to know that i have a father who redeemed me who gave his life for me and now has gifted me with a testimony that i can now go and tell to others so whether you're watching us from online or you're here let's stand up and let's worship and thank god for this testimony
so good to be with you this morning, church. I want to turn our attention this morning to uh, a character in the Bible that we will know as Abraham. Some of you might know this story, uh, but if you haven't, I want to give you the Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, there's a man in the, in the book of Genesis named Abraham who is told by God that he is going to be a father to the nations. And the only problem with that is Abraham has no children of his own. And him and his wife are both past the age of being able to have children. Uh, but God does what he always does, which is shows off because Abraham and his wife in their old age have a son whom they name Isaac. And so our story today takes us to Genesis chapter 22, which is the story when God tells Abraham, take Isaac up onto the mountain and sacrifice him as an offering to me. And I almost, I can't imagine the thought in Abraham's mind of, okay, this was the son that I didn't ever think I would have, but now here I am being asked to sacrifice him. But God, or excuse me, but Abraham who trusted God takes Isaac up onto the mountain and he gets as close to sacrificing Isaac as to holding the knife in his hand. And he's the moment before it happens and the angel of the Lord speaks to Abraham and says, Abraham, stop. Don't lay a hand on that boy. And it says that Abraham turned and looked at the angel of the Lord. And the angel said to him, because you have done this, I know that you fear God. Because you have done this, I recognize that you trust the Lord. And most of us know the ending of this story where Abraham looks over at a bush off in the distance and sees a ram whose horns are caught in the bush. And so Abraham and Isaac sacrifice this ram in Isaac's place. And I think the next part is what's so important because in our English translation, we read it as Abraham called this place the mountain where the Lord will provide. In the Hebrew, it says something a little different. Abraham actually calls the mountain a name and he calls it Jehovah Jireh. And the Hebrew translation with that is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And I find myself thinking about what Abraham would have been thinking in this moment, because there he was walking up this mountain to sacrifice his son. I can't imagine Abraham was content with the circumstance that he found himself in at that moment. He couldn't have been content with it. But I think he had to be content in it. And I think there's a big difference for us today. In our pain, in our frustration, in our suffering, in the brokenness of this world, God does not ask us to be content with those circumstances, but he's called every single one of us to be content in them. The Apostle Paul thought he was gonna to go to Spain to preach the gospel, but yet he ended up being in prison. But he was content in the circumstances and the scripture even says that the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison, was singing and praising the Lord and that he had favor with the guards because of it. God today, is not asking us to be content with any circumstance of our life, but he is saying, hey, I am with you in it. That's true for all of us today. So I wanna sing a song, I wanna declare this, I want our words as we sing it to be a declaration that whether we believe that or not today, whether being content in a circumstance is hard, I want our words as we sing them to inspire faith within one another and within this community. So let's sing this together. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. I wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you 
It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right.
truth this morning that because you're enough we have everything we need to prosper because you're enough we have everything we need to be loved by you Lord, if you dress the lilies of the field in all of their splendor, how much more will you clothe those who you call your children? That's the promise. So God, I pray that we could learn what seems like the simple commandment that you gave Moses, to love your God above all others. Lord, let us learn how to do that today. Let us learn how to spend our life learning to love you. So we say yes and we say amen to who you are, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it praise this morning. Yeah, come on. Well, it's so good to be together this morning. If you're joining us in the room, say hi to the people around you, and then you can grab your seat. And if you're joining us online from wherever you are, we're glad that you're here. there. It is so good to be worshiping with all of you today. My name is Julia Moyer. I'm the HR director here at Vineyard Cincinnati. And if you're new, you need to know that we at Vineyard Cincinnati seek to live and love like Jesus. And what does that mean? Well, it means we're going to love well, do good, and give it all away. You know, in our faith journey, I've discovered that God wants us to be an active participant in the life of the church. You know, this life is not a spectator sport. We're not looking down upon the field of ministry just kind of from the stands. No, 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 no. The God we serve has chosen us. We get to play. And so, it means we can't just have our head in the game. We have to also have our heart in the game, right? And so knowing that God wants our heart in the game means that we need to be intentional about how we show up, right? How we show up to serve together, how we show up to worship together, how we show up to give together, and how we show up to pray together. And speaking of praying together, there are prayer request cards located in the back of your seats. Our staff, as well as our prayer team, consider it a privilege and an honor to pray for you. You never have to go through a tough season alone when you're on Team Jesus, right? And if you're online, we're not leaving you out. You can go to vineyardcincinnati.com slash prayer. And we would be, again, happy to pray for you. All right, getting back to giving. You know, it should come as no surprise to you that it pleases my little HR heart that we are an equal opportunity giver here. So there are several ways that you can give. 
You can either text, which is my personal favorite. You can go online to vineyardcincinnati.com slash give. Or you can just simply put cash or check uh, in an envelope or in one of our giving boxes that are located all over uh, this campus in our info areas. All right. Let's ask the Lord's blessing over this offering, shall we? Father, we thank you so much. Uh, that your word promises that you will give seed to the sower. So we thank you that you have given us increase, that we could give it back to you, that you would enlarge your footprint in this community, that um, your kingdom, Lord, would be enlarged uh, because we have joined you and what you're trying to do in and through us in this city. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I have a little announcement here about Turkey Fest. So, uh, for those of you who are new and are like, Turkey Fest, what is that? Well, Turkey Fest is easily our favorite event of the year. I mean, it's, it's an opportunity for us to literally come alongside people in need and give them boxes of food for Thanksgiving. So, I'm gonna share some numbers with you. Yesterday, we assembled 450 boxes. That was all, you know, based off of giving that you all had given us. And so uh, the year before, you added 150 boxes to that. This year, you added 500 boxes to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a total of 950 boxes. So doing the math on that, if each box uh, serves five people, we've actually impacted and had an opportunity to serve, based off of you, know, you all's generosity, 4,750 people throughout the city. Yes, that's awesome, isn't it? But you know what? It only happens when we come together and do it together. It took more than 158 volunteers serving in three separate locations, including our campus, to make all of that happen. So we're super proud. Yeah, yeah. Well, before I go and hand it over to Raul, who's going to finalize our series on uh, supernatural living, um, we want to share with you just a small glimpse of Turkey Fest that took place yesterday morning. Watch this clip. glad to be, that we get to be blessed so that we can be a blessing. And in speaking about blessings, as I finish this series on supernatural and God's, uh, the more of God invading Vineyard Cincinnati Church, I have my friend for, and one of the pastors here, Alex, who wants to share with you a testimony of something incredible that the Lord did uh, during a retreat that the students had uh, last weekend. Yeah. How you guys doing? <laughs> All right, settle down. <laughs> Those are all mine. Uh, hey, guys. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, I got invited to just come up and talk to you guys about what's going on with students, and it's been really awesome. Like, honestly, genuinely, really awesome. 
We were at a retreat called The Outpouring last weekend up at Camp Chautauqua. Something like 13 vineyard churches all in this area all came together and attended. Some 300 students were there. We took uh, somewhere in the ballpark of about 80 people from our church to that event, and it was really awesome. Uh, I think all told, when we just looked at everything the Lord was doing that weekend, something like 100 students took some degree of next step with Jesus, whether that was a first-time commitment or a rededication or a stronghold broken off in their life. Just some, some type of next step was taken by over 100 students last weekend, which is amazing. And as much as I love all those statistics and the numbers, I think stories move us more than anything else. So as we're continuing to go down this supernatural trend, this, uh, this series, that's the word I'm looking for, series. Everybody say series. Okay, that's the word, series. Uh, I wanna read you a supernatural story of something that happened this past weekend. So this is a testimony from a ninth grade student, and she says, my entire life, I had always thought I wanted to go into the medical field. I'd always said, this is my calling, this is what I'm here to do. And she goes on to say, but I think that might have just been me thinking about all the glory and money, having a big house, a big family, and being able to be on top and go to the best school, et cetera. But last night when I was praying, I heard God telling me that's not at all my calling. It's that I am to be a leader and to draw people to him. I don't know what that means, but maybe that's being a youth pastor or being in ministry. And gang, that is a supernatural heart change. That is God getting into someone's, yeah, we can clap for that. That's God getting into someone's heart. And there's nothing wrong with being a doctor. If you're a doctor, thank you, I need you. Uh, but that's someone who wants to give their life to the Lord in a really specific way and is listening to him and hearing him speak. And that's amazing. So Raul's gonna tell us more about a supernatural life today, and I'm excited. So Amen. thanks, appreciate you. Amen. We're, we're glad that the God that we serve is a God that's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore who offers salvation without reservation to all people He redeems all people, and irrespective of whether they're male, female, slave, or free, they all become one in Christ, and ultimately, that same God is the one that apportions the gift or the gifts of his Holy Spirit to young and old alike. And we are glad that we are in a church that believes in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and all that God has for us. Before we start, I'm going to ask you, to join me in a word of prayer and ask for God's blessing as we uh, go uh, and, and check out God's word today for us. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you uh, that you are here with us and we worship you for who you are, Father God, not the God of our imagination, but the God of revelation. You have made yourself known in in creation, in human conscience. Uh, you have made yourself known in the scriptures and in the most sublime way that you made yourself known is in the person of Jesus Christ. As we gather together, Father, we revere you. We open our hearts to the more of God. We pray for, that you will grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, Father God, that we may know the hope of our calling, the glorious riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceedingly great power that is at work in us who believe, and we pray these things in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ and God's people. Said, Amen. Amen. Let's get to it. So today we're gonna. Uh, I have the unenviable task of cleaning up after Matt, Beth, Beth and uh, the mess that Clay made. Uh, <laughs> and it's a challenge because I'm an English as a second language person. So figure that one out. God has a sense of humor. Oh. I'm going to say it today because we, this is the last service. So I've been thinking about this joke, right? It sounds like a joke. So I said, you know, uh, a white woman, a white man, a black man, and a Puerto Rican go to a church. Oh, hold up for a second. That's our preaching rotation. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> That's our preaching team. Anyhow, may God restore within us the ability to laugh at ourselves and to live together in harmony and in peace. Amen. Amen. You can crucify me later. (laughs) 
So when you hear the expression, everyone gets to play, what do you think of? So yesterday, as I was thinking about everyone gets to play, the image that came to my mind was when, when I was 11 years old and uh, I was playing Little League Baseball. Uh, and I'm one of those people who has made it, um, made, made, made the fact that uh, Roberto Clemente, Carlos Correa, they have a legacy to uphold because of people like me. I sucked at baseball. <laughs> Nevertheless, I was on the bench, and when I thought of everyone gets to play, I remember distinctly one afternoon where I was kept creeping up next to the, to, the, to the coach so that he would put me in. We were just getting killed in the game. And all of a sudden he says, uh, Latoni, get in, go to right field. I go to right field, the glove is bigger than I am. I'm waiting there, it seemed like the whole day nobody would hit a ball to right field. Here I am at the end of the game, we lost, and I have nothing to show for it. And I wanted to convince my mom that I had actually been in the game. So what I did is I went running from base to base and sliding at each base. I got as dirty as I possibly could so that she would be convinced that I was in the game. Well, when we say everyone gets to play in the kingdom of God, that's not what we mean. As a matter of fact, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, the person who God used as an instrument uh, uh, to bring about this movement that desires to unleash the fullness of God upon all of God's people so that we, as the word says, that whole earth one day will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. It has always been God's intention to dwell in people, to work in people, and to work through people so that ultimately the glory of God can be made known upon the whole face of the earth. John Wimber, this is one of his favorite expressions, everyone gets to play. And in his mind and in his ministry philosophy, he was seeking to recover the place of the priesthood of all believers, the place where we are all understanding that we have all received gifts from God, that we are responsible for the exercise of those gifts in order to build the church into which God has brought us and in order to advance the kingdom of God. But what happened throughout human history is that Slowly but surely, after the inception of the church, some who were in positions of leadership or governance over the churches, uh, little by little, they started uh, thinking that it was within their prerogative and discretion to have the power and the authority, and that not everyone got to play. Only those that had been ordained and appointed got to play. So much so that in our recent past history, some well-meaning Christian organizations and churches, in order to equip people for the work of the ministry, they founded Bible colleges and seminaries, nothing against them, in order to prepare people for the work of the ministry. And what ended up happening is that there was a greater and greater gap between the people that actually got to do the ministry and the people who received the ministry. But as we will see today, it has never been God's plan or intention to disable the body of Christ, but to enable and empower the body of Christ in order to exert a sanctifying, saving, and delivering influence that advances the power and the presence of the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. In John chapter 15 and verse 16, the scripture clearly lets us know, each and every one of us, Jesus says to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit so that your fruit may abide. It is in the center of the will of God that we recognize that we have been empowered by Almighty God so that we can go and represent them upon the face of the earth. God appointed us to bear much fruit. And today we will wrestle or try to answer the question, if it is God's intention that we all individually and co collectively participate in advancing the kingdom of God, and if it is God's mind that we would all get to play, how in the world do we get in on that? How do we get to play? 
One way that you don't get to play is by cozying up to the pastor and asking him to put you in the game. That's not how you get to play. That's how I got to play a long time ago. It was a joke. Um, so the first thing that I want to say, how do we get to play? First and foremost, we need to recognize and acknowledge that we have all received spiritual gifts. If you have your Bible, your telephone, open it up. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16, and allowing the Word of God to guide us and teach us on how we all get to play. The first three verses say as follows, but grace was given to the pastors and the leaders of the church. No, to each one of us, to you, to me, according to the measure of Christ's gift, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. It's a lot of words in there. The word gift is used five times in these three verses. And it's not the same word for gift that is used there. But the word that is used uh, at times, you know, when we, it begins, God and the Apostle Paul wants to ground all this in the grace of God. He wants you to be convinced that God has not only made it available, but that it is his good and kind intention to give you what he has already procured and secured because of his life and death at Calvary. Do you know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness through the resurrection from the dead? That when, God, when Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, as he had already promised, he got vindicated because they knew he was who he said that he was because he, has, he said, I will, be, you know, I will send another comforter, one that will be in you, not on, no longer alongside you, but inside of you. It is the will of God that we be empowered. And the life to which God has called us, when we speak of supernatural, naturally supernatural, what we mean is that God calls ordinary men and women, like you and I, to do extraordinary things. Why does he do that? The Bible explains it and says that we have the vessel, we have, uh, we have you know, this gift in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power and the glory may be of God and not of men. It is God's intention that he will move through people like us and many times in spite of us so that he can get all the glory. God is well pleased to give us all things. But many times when we think of the more of God and as we continue to move in this direction where we believe God is rewriting or writing a new chapter in the life of Vineyard Cincinnati Church, we're leaning into the more of God. We think that many times we have to overcome the reluctance of God to give us what he has already predestined for us before the foundation of the world. We think that we pray to God in order to bend his arm and convince him to give us something that he doesn't want to give us, that he's a stingy God. But nothing could be further than the truth. There's three things that we need to understand. First and foremost, these three verses, ground first and foremost, it says, we have all received grace. And the grace it's speaking about here is the unmerited favor of God that empowers us to live supernatural lives, even as natural people. The truth of the matter is that we're not just natural people. The Bible says, you know, that, that unless a man or a woman is born again, they cannot see or enter into the kingdom of God. You have been born again. I have been born again the moment that I believed in Jesus Christ. So since the inception of this life that I live, I have lived it by the power of the Spirit. So it is God's will that we receive this enabling grace of God that would allow us to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible uh, tells us in these verses as well. It says that he who descended is the same one who ascended. And what it's speaking of is using the imagery of a conquering or a victorious king that goes into a foreign land and he takes away the spoils 
of that land after he defeats them. And it's speaking about Jesus' triumphant procession. Colossians speaks of Jesus triumphing over Satan, over sin and death, and making a public spectacle of him on the cross. Exactly at the place where Satan thought that he had triumphed over Jesus, Jesus dealt him a death blow on the cross. And this triumphant sovereign victor now is enriching his kingdom through the giving of gifts. He wants to convince us that there is plenty and there's plenty more where that came from in the house of God. Lastly, in these three verses, he wants to convince us of the fact that it says there that Jesus ascended. He's the one that gave gifts to man. And he says, according to the measure, so that he could fill all in all. I went to the cabinet the other day and I opened up a can of, a little can of cinnamon. Have you ever noticed that it has two different ways that you can uh, pour the cinnamon? One of them is uh, the free-for-all kind. No, I call it the free-for-all one. Where you just pop that thing and you make a mess for your wife to clean up if you're married. And the other one is the one you use just to sprinkle a little bit on your oatmeal. When it speaks of Jesus wanting and giving gifts, he says because he wanted to fill everything in everyone. Do you know that our God does not sprinkle? Do you know that our God pours out abundantly? If through the reception of spiritual gifts we're able, we're able to do the works of Jesus so that the name of Jesus may become notorious upon the face of the earth, why would he give us less than more than enough? So Jesus came to give us a full sprinkling. Romans 8.32 puts this this way so that you can understand and get acquainted and allow it to settle upon your heart. The fact that God is well willing to give you everything that he has uh, for you. Romans 8, 32 says, He, speaking of God the Father, who did not withhold his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not together with him freely give us all things? Today you need to be convinced that God has freely, willingly, lovingly, abundantly given each and every one of us spiritual gifts. My second point today is that some people in the body of Christ have been gifted to equip believers for the work of service. So there's one thing of knowing and acknowledging that you have a gift, but there's another thing when you come to the realization that God not only gave gifts to to men or to people, God gave also people as gifts to the church. And the word says here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Speaks there uh, of, of five-fold ministry, of five offices. Every baseball player, you know, my problem was that I quit baseball because I didn't think, you know, I had the natural ability. But not everyone has natural ability. You develop it as you work closely with coaches and mentors and other players. In the game that God is calling us to play, when he is inviting us to participate in the work of advancing the kingdom of God, he also desires to use other people to enhance our skills. You see, I went to seminary, right? It doesn't make me any better or any more spiritual than anyone else. I didn't go to seminary to become a pastor. I went there to sharpen my pastor machete in seminary so I could cut down people when I came out of seminary. <laughs> Just kidding. Poor illustration. Poor illustration. Matt gave it to me before service. I won't use it anymore. So God has equally gifted people in the body of Christ so that these individuals can help, um, can position us and help us to develop the practical skills that we need in order to take Jesus 
outside of the four walls of this building. As a matter of fact, one clear example is Clay, our brother Clay. One of his specific uh, responsibilities that Clay has is to uh, help people to be trained in practical ministry skills, how to pray for others, how to share uh, the good news of Jesus or the heart of the Father with others. So it is in his unique gifting, he has a function within the body of Christ that will help him to equip the saints, which is each and every one of us, for the work of the ministry. So the word apostle means someone who has been sent out. In the most literal sense of the word, apostles are the 12 that lived with Jesus and uh, the ones that saw Jesus after his resurrection, the apostle Paul, right? They had the authority. They were inspired, some of them, to write scripture. Nevertheless, the function of apostleship or the office of apostleship is one that remains until this day. These are people who have an entrepreneurial spirit. These are people that have been gifted by God, and they have a trajectory of evangelism and discipleship. They have fruit, fruit in those areas of ministry. And they're called by God specifically not only to export or bring the message of the gospel, but also to bring the institution of the church to places where the church does not exist currently. These are people that are apostles in that sense. They're sent out. Missionaries, many times, church planters function in this uh, apostolic uh, anointing. The second one that it mentions here, and by the way, there's other lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible, some of them found in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12. This is just one of the And this one focuses on those that are equipping ministries, equipping gifts. The prophets are people that speak the truth of God. Some people have uh, summarized it this way. Prophets either foretell or foretell the truth of God. We have the example of Agabus in the New Testament. Even though the apostles were receiving revelation from God and they were writing the scriptures, there was a situation in which God needed to communicate a message to God's people, and he uses Agabus in Acts chapter 11 and Acts 21, first to warn that there was going to be a great famine coming among, among them. And secondly, he tells, uh, he tells Paul that he is going to be uh, taken to jail or imprisoned in, Rome, in, in, in Jerusalem. So God, the same God that spoke then is the same God that speaks now. We are a charismatic church, which means we believe in the fullness of the Spirit. We do not believe that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased with the completion of the Scripture. Nonetheless, being on the vineyard tradition, we are in the radical middle. We believe that our belief in the sufficiency of the Scriptures and the fullness of, this, of, of the Spirit are not mutually exclusive propositions. We can hold on to them with, with assurance, knowing that we can have all of the Spirit and have all that God has intended for us and in His revealed will found in the Scriptures. John Wimber as well, I believe he, sa he said this, and Clay had mentioned it before, right? That if we are people, because we don't believe in the gifts, we dismiss uh, the spirit and we just hold on to the word. If you have the word and no spirit, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to dry up. Then we have people on the charismatic side, Pentecostals and others, who hold to the fullness of the Spirit, and sometimes we become lazy and complacent. We're so caught up in getting those subjective words from God that we never check them out with the manual. The Bible does not say to despise or to do away with prophecies. What it says is that we are, we are not to despise prophecy, but we are to test the spirits. Against what? This is the standard. So we are people in the radical middle who say the sufficiency of the Scripture, the fullness of the Spirit, and everything that God has for us. You can't be so, you can't be so concerned with getting a word from God that you dismiss the actual word of God. Because then you will not know. 
I mentioned in the previous sermon, and some people didn't laugh at this, but no shame in my game. <laughs> I said, as my psychiatrist kindly reminded me, that not every thought that came to my mind came from God. Neither. I don't know if you have a psychiatrist, but if you don't have one, I'm going to break the news to you. Not everything that comes to your mind comes from God. Some of it comes from your own flesh, from your imagination, from your fallen heart. Some of it comes from, can come from the devil. How, how will you know? How will you discern by knowing the word of God? The Bible tells us clearly that, that, you know, the grass withers, the flowers fall, but that the word of God, what, abides forever. We can't get holier apart from the word of God. The Bible says that we are to be sanctified in the truth. Your word is the truth. So we are asserting today that God has gifted these people to confirm the word of God. So prophets are people that speak forth the word of God into a particular situation who foretell things that are yet to come, or people who are gifted to speak strongly and with authority for the consolation, for the correction of the church and the people of God. Thirdly, it mentions there evangelists. And evangelists are people that are gifted communicators of the word of God. These are people that are thoroughly acquainted with the message of the grace of the gospel of God. That all human beings are lost, and unless they believe in Jesus Christ, they have a snowball's chance in hell. That wasn't good either, was it? <laughs> the truth of the matter is this. A salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And if there was any other way that people could be saved... God would not have sent his son to be brutalized on the cross to pay the price for our sins. But although these are people that hold the office of evangelists and they're very gifted at communicating the gospel of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, these are not the only people responsible. They have a primary responsibility, but not a unique responsibility. In Acts 1.8, the Lord speaks to the disciples and he tells them, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what was true of then is true of today. If you have been saved by God, you have witnessed something. You have witnessed the forgiveness of your own personal sins. And even though you might not be a gifted evangelist, you are still called to give witness to the goodness of God in your life. Lastly, pastors and teachers. And pastors are people that oversee the work of God. Oversee, they overlook, uh, the, uh, they look over the spiritual well being of congregations. There are people that are gifted by God to take care and to nurture the people of God in various aspects. This gift of pastor and teacher can be separate. Most people uh, believe that this is one and the same. And there's truth to it. Pastors are always teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. I know a lot of teachers that have no patience. They love the scripture. They teach it well. But don't tell them to go into a difficult situation with somebody. They might be in the wrong business, I, th I say, because it's the kingdom of God. We're all about people. If you don't love people, but anyhow. Let me stop my commentary there. <laughs> Pastors and teachers, these are people who care for the body and who feed the body, who help to supplement the spiritual uh, nurturing of the body of Christ through their gifts. We need to understand that as a participant invited to advance the kingdom of God, we do not all enter the game and stay the same way, but that this five-fold office is responsible for helping us hone and enhance our skills so that we can uh, be proficient in advancing the kingdom of God. Lastly, we're all responsible for the maturity of the body of Christ and God's people. So we know that we have all received gifts. We know that there's some specific people in the body of Christ, coaches that will help us enhance our gifts. But ultimately, 
the maturity of the believers is dependent upon whom? All of us. Look at what the Word of God says. He gave apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. That's the goal, maturity. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ Jesus. So ultimately, the goal and the responsibility for maturity and growth in the body of Christ is not just about developing skills, but God is also after our understanding growing as well until we attain to the fullness of the measure. The standard is Christ Jesus. It says we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of God. Many people dismiss getting knowledge about God. There's two different things. You can know about God or you can know God personally. For every biblical principle, there is, there is also in the scripture uh, a corresponding experience to cement that biblical principle. One example of that is uh, in John chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, the Bible says this, you know, that, that he came to, that which, to those which were his own. His own received them not, but to them that received them, to them he gave the power, the authority to be called children of God. That is the objective truth. But then it goes on in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, and, say, and it says that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. But many of us, as we delve into this more of God, are afraid of the experiences. Our God is a God who, who is experienced, has been experienced fully by the people that speak about him. How do you think they got to know him? The measure is Jesus Christ. I also want to say that this portion of Scripture lets us know that we will never be everything that we were meant to become if we are isolated from other believers. Sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus, is a, is a, a team sport. I need you and you need me. I have blind sides. You have blind sides. Bible says open rebuke is better than hidden love. You can love me all you want, but if you don't tell me the truth about me, you're not doing me no favors. That's what people that dealt drugs with me did. They would pat me on the back. They would never tell me the truth about my life. But it is not God's intention. The Bible says that he wants each and every one of us to be a participant in speaking the truth and love to one another. If you speak just truth to people, you're bound to hurt people. If you speak just in love to people, you're bound to enable people. The currency of the kingdom is truth in love. God wants not only to perfect us in our skills, but he wants to mature us in our knowledge and understanding of him. And ultimately, he wants to develop proper and corresponding character that gives credence to the message that we speak to others. Ultimately, this will lead to the responsible exercise of the gift. Someone has said that spiritual gifts are not toys to play with. They're not weapons to fight with. But they are tools to build with. As we close today, and as we think of these three things by which we can engage or great, uh, in greater manner, in the game that God has called us to, right? We can all get to play. It's not a game. Well, it's a game of, it, it, it is the task. It is the mission of the redemption of humanity. We must acknowledge that we have all received gifts. What are you doing with your gift? Do you know what your gift is? If you don't know, I'm going to invite you to go to our website, Vineyard Cincinnati, and just type in there, what's my spiritual gift? You'll find there uh, spiritual gifts assessment that you can take. We also recognize that some have been gifted specifically 
but that the same spirit that's in operation in apostles, pastors, and teachers is the same spirit that is at work in you for your specific place and gifting in the kingdom of God. Their function is different, but the spirit is the same. And lastly, will you not only acknowledge, will you commit to your responsibility to be part of what God wants to do in Vineyard Cincinnati and beyond for building us up so that we can all become mature. I want to be part of that. If you want to be part of that, let's pray. Father, we just thank and praise you. We give you glory for your word and your truth, oh Father God. Thank you, Father God, that you have invited each and every one of us to play. Thank you, Father, that your word clearly states that you have appointed each and every one of us to go and bear fruit. And so that our fruit will be of eternal significance and it may abide. Today, Father God, we acknowledge our privilege. And we, Father God, acquiesce, oh, Father God, to the responsibility that we have to one another to build and to edify your church and to advance your kingdom. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.
sing it out that everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never end your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out on my soul cries out our souls cry out to you Lord our souls cry out to the Lord our souls cry out more of him today I want you to say this to yourself Lord I need more of you right now I want to go ahead and invite the prayer teams to come forward if you want more of the Lord right now I want you to come forward and get prayer No time to wait when it comes to the Lord. If you want more of the Father right now, come down right now. If you want to step into that authority today, come down right now and get prayer. Yeah, come on. Let the faith rise in the room today. something that God does in response to our obedience to him John 14 21 he says this he says whoever has my words and keeps them it is he who loves me and I will love him my father will love him and I will manifest myself to him sometimes we're crying out for the more of God for God to show up and God is just waiting for us to take one tiny step you might say you know what I've been in service uh, many years and whatever and many times we become the only impediment that God has to move in our midst and to do that, give us the breakthrough that he has for us. 
Remember that the word of God says that he is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or even imagine. So if what you need is a breakthrough in your life, what you need is salvation, what you need is deliverance. You've been struggling with a pattern of sin that's been consuming you. The Lord tells you today it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Maybe you just need to be born again of the spirit. And I want you to just raise your hand wherever you happen to be, whatever your need needs to be. You need your marriage restored. And believe that God, our God, is a God of the now, of the here and now. And that he hears your cry and that he is working on your behalf. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we commit your people to you. We commit ourselves, Father God, realizing your abundant grace that brought us, Father God, into your family, that gifted us, and that one day will take us to glory. Father, we pay for the, pray for the full expression of your Holy Spirit manifested through the giftedness and passion of individuals in the body of Christ who speak the truth and love to one another and build each other up so that we can represent you properly and advance the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and God's people said, God bless you. We love you.